In this video, we'll look into heat conduction, heat conduction inside materials and fluids. And it is a fact that heat can be transferred through solid materials or stagnant gases or liquids. And that's heat conduction, <coughs> by heat conduction. But how large or how great is the heat flow through different building materials? And what is thermal conductivity, thermal resistance, and computational tools for 2D and 3D cases? That's something we'll go through in this video. We'll look at, first of all look into one-dimensional theory, heat conduction through a, a single layer. And what we know is that heat flows from higher temperature to lower ones. And the heat flow, Q here on the right hand side, uh, will be proportional to the exposed area, will be proportional to the temperature difference across the layer. And it will be inversely proportional to the thickness of the layer. This means that if we have a double thickness, we'll have half the heat flow. And different materials conduct heat differently well. And we're using lambda value or the thermal conductivity as something as significant for something that describes the, heat, the, the material. The unit of thermal conductivity is watt per meter Kelvin or watt per meter Celsius. And here is a, a table with the thermal conductivity of different materials and gases. We start with krypton and argon, which are uh, noble gases and they have very low thermal conductivity, 0 0.009 or 0 0.017. And we have air which is 0.025, quite low as well. And then we have a couple of uh, thermal insulation material, glass wool and EPS, uh, expanded polyskyptyrene, it's 0.035, rather close to, to air. Wood, almost four times greater than the min mineral wool, for instance. Air concrete, even a bit higher. And then different type of materials. And we see brick wall, concrete, it's more stone materials, quite high thermal conductivity and solid rock very high. And then the, min the, the metal, like steel and aluminium, have copper, they have very high thermal conductivity. Snow, which is very porous, contains a lot of air inside, it's quite low. Then we have water and ice, and ice is, has quite high thermal conductivity. The thermal resistance, uh, which has a unit square meter Kelvin per watt or square meter Celsius per watt, is a way of explaining how well uh, it resists transfer of heat or transfer by conduction. And R is defined by, the, uh, is equal to D divided by lambda, thickness divided by thermal conductivity. And for a specific layer, then we can write down expression for the heat flow. So the Q, the heat flow, will be equal to the area times the temperature difference divided by the thermal resistance. So if we have the, the layer with double thermal resistance, we, have to have, we just have half the heat flow through the layer. And here are some examples of thermal resistances for different layers. First of all, 50 millimeter of glass wool. We calculate it by taking the thickness, 0.05, divided by the thermal conductivity, that would be 1.4. Roughly the same value as for 200 millimeter of air concrete, or 25 millimeter of wood. Then we have brick wall, brick wall concrete, etc. Here we can compare how good they are in protecting a building, for instance, from, from heat losses. Let's take an example. To calculate, we'll try to calculate the heat flow through a 50 millimeter thick glass wool layer. We have a temperature difference of 20 degrees across the layer, and the area, total area, is 100 square meter. So then we're just using the formula from the previous slide Q equal to 100 times 20. 100 is the area, 20 is the temperature difference, and divided by the thermal resistance 1.4, and we get 1429 watt or 1.43 kilowatts. If we instead take uh, a corresponding case with 130 millimeter of concrete, uh, which has the thermal resistance 0.05, we get quite a much higher number. We get 40,000 watt or 40 kilowatts. So then we can compare how well they insulate, how much heat that is transferred through the materials. 
It could be of interest to know how the temperature looks inside the layer. Here we have the temperature on left side, left hand side T plus, and on the right hand side T minus. And when it's in steady state, when the, it has been um, stabilized, the temperature field, we have to have the same heat flow through the whole layer. Otherwise, there will be accumulation of heat somewhere if more is coming from the left and then it's going out to the right. And the temperature profile will be linear. We have the same thermal resist sorry, same uh, thermal conductivity in the layer. We'll have a straight linear drop from the left side of the layer to the right hand side layer. This can be extrapolated and look into uh, when we have many layers together, still one dimensional cases. We have three different materials, different thicknesses, and we can see with the T plus on the left hand side surface and T minus on the right hand side surface, we'll have the heat flow through the structure equal Q, will be proportional once again to the, uh, the area A times the temperature difference across the whole structure, and we divide it by the total thermal resistance of all the layers together. And they are obtained by just adding the, surf uh, the, the thermal resistance of each layer. So R tot is equal to R1 plus R2 plus R3. And R1 is, for instance, the thickness divided by the thermal conductivity, lambda 1, of that layer. We also see that the temperature falls linearly in each of the layers. And the temperature drop for each layer will be <coughs> directly proportional to the thermal resistance of the layer. So if we have very high thermal resistance in one layer, there will be a huge or a big drop in the temperature at that spot. So those results were for one-dimensional cases, but in, in real cases, many of the, the many of the problems will concern heat transfer in two or three D situations. And here are some one cases with foundations. On the left hand side we see the, the beam, the edge beam of a slab on ground. Uh, and the different temperatures are, are represented by different colors. We call isotherms we can see. So in between where the two two colors are meeting, we have an isotherm where the temperature is, will be the same along the whole line. And this part will be the concrete, that's the floor of, of the slab. And here we have resistances or insulations in, in the slab underneath the concrete and in the wall. And we see we have many sh different colors. The temperature will drop quite a lot through these layers where we have a, a big thermal resistance. And that relates to our previous 1D case where we have big temperature drops, where we have big uh, thermal resistances. On the right hand side we see a blow up, we see uh, go deep down underneath the, the, the slab and we see this thermal pillow which is caused by the heat loss from, from the foundation which constantly heats up or make the, the soil underneath the building warmer than in the surrounding areas. So let's sum it up. Uh, thermal conductivity shows how well a material can conduct heat. Thermal resistance gives a structure's capability to reduce the heat flow through it. In a layer structure, the temperature changes linearly in each homogeneous layer. This is one of the cases, steady state. The heat flow through a layer structure is proportional to the exposed area and the temperature difference and inversely proportional to the total thermal resistance. For more complicated geometries like two and three dimensional cases, Computational tools can be used to assess the temperature field and heat flows.